General George S. Patton's forces race across France in one of the greatest advances in military history. But exhilaration turns into frustration as they near the German border. Supply problems cripple Patton's advance. Heavy rains turn roads into swamps. And the retreating Germans suddenly launch deadly counterattacks. Mistakes are made, but heroes emerge in some of the fiercest tank battles of World War II. General George S. Patton. His bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360-degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, on Hitler's doorstep. September 1944. Following General George Patton's historic race across France and the Soviets' continuing gains on the Eastern Front, the Allies are beginning to squeeze Hitler like a vice. The Fuhrer desperately wants to change the momentum. September 8th, 3 a.m. Outside the town of Mary, France, in the middle of the night, a column of tanks and other vehicles moves down a small, lightly wooded country road. Corporal Don Knapp of Whitman, Massachusetts, is a tank commander in the 712th Tank Battalion. It's his night to keep watch. He's trying to figure out if the vehicle sounds in the darkness are friend or foe. And then they get abreast, and there's some trucks going by, and a German sitting on the tailgate talking. And I could hear him, you know, that's close. And I, so I got out quietly. We weren't visible because, you know, we were in, sort of camouflaged in the trees. Knapp goes to alert his company commander. But before the rest of the company could be woken, the German 106th Panzer Brigade moves past. Then, 200 yards away, the German column stumbles right into the 90th Infantry Division's headquarters and artillery units. For the enemy to suddenly launch a thrust that places him within reach of your divisional headquarters and divisional artillery is very, very bad news. A Sherman tank assigned to protect HQ nails a German half-track at the end of the column. The Panzer Brigade suddenly realizes it's in the middle of an American camp. German and American tanks blast away then scatter in the darkness. No matter how well you prepare, sometimes you're just caught off guard. I mean, the Americans were completely surprised, but they regrouped, and then they took care of business. The next morning, Knapp and two other Shermans find a protected spot near a road. Only their barrels are visible. And they don't have to wait long for a target to approach. All by itself, we see a panther coming down, slowly. So we threw everything out of it. We caught him down by the bogey wheels in the back. Big explosion and a big black smoking ring come up. By the end of the day, Patton's troops have decimated the Panzer Brigade. Knocking out 21 German tanks and tank destroyers, 60 half-tracks, over 100 support vehicles, and taken 764 prisoners. But on this same day, September 8th, General Patton is frustrated beyond belief, not with his troops, but with his bosses. The resentment has been building for days. Flashback. Eight days earlier, August 31st, 1944. Patton's Third Army has just completed an unprecedented sweep across France. 
in August, he swept through, got to the Seine River, crossed the Seine River, continued moving, advances all the way to eastern France. And then he stops. General Patton is forced to do something that is completely and utterly counter to his nature. Gasoline deliveries to Patton's Third Army have suddenly fallen from about 400,000 gallons a day to almost nothing. Patton is stuck in the Lorraine region of France, only 60 miles from the fortified Siegfried line at the German border. He wants to thrust into Germany towards Frankfurt. And he can't because he doesn't have the gasoline to fill up the vehicles, to move the tanks, the half-tracks, the jeeps, the tank destroyers, and all of the other vehicles forward. Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower has given the fuel priority to Patton's rival, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, who's trying to advance with other Allied forces across Belgium and Holland. Patton becomes so frustrated at the situation, he basically says, if Eisenhower would just stop holding Montgomery's hand and give me the supplies I need, I could go through the Siegfried line like through a goose. Now, Patton and his men are stuck west of the Moselle River, only able to fight local battles. The Allied pause in September is a godsend to the German army. At this point in the war, the Germans are feeling defeated. They're basically walking back into Germany. The pause gives the Germans time to regroup, and meet whatever the Allies are going to dish out. During Germany's disastrous summer, Hitler fired his top general in the West, Gerd von Rundstedt. The Fuhrer was also slightly wounded during an assassination attempt. But on September 1st, Hitler reinstates the well-respected von Rundstedt. Stability is returning to the German ranks. Von Rundstedt is basically your quintessential caricature of what a German or Prussian general would look like. He's ramrod straight, he wears the old Prussian helmet with the spike coming out of the top. He's one of the most experienced generals in World War II. The Germans don't know that Patton's hands are tied. But Patton wants to keep taking any small steps forward that he can. So on September 8th, Units of the 20th Corps, under the command of Major General Walton Walker, attempt to move east at Dorno. Target, the Moselle River. Strategy, advance past the Moselle, break the Lorraine stalemate, and take the war into Germany. Tactics, an amphibious assault by the 5th Infantry Division to secure a bridgehead, establish pontoons, and then bring armor across on portable bridges. Weeks earlier, Kelly Lemon kept his unit moving when he swam across a river under enemy fire and brought rowboats back when assault boats weren't available. But at Dorno, things don't go well from the start. I found myself uh, in a dogfight with a brigadier general from the 7th Armored Division who claimed he was supposed to cross there. Lemon's men were supposed to cross in assault boats under the cover of darkness on September 7th. Now, due to the traffic jam, the element of surprise is completely gone. As they cross in midday on the 8th, German artillery pounds Dorno as heavy rain begins to fall. The assault boats don't offer much protection. The M1 assault boat is made of plywood. The 16-foot-long boat weighs only 300 pounds. It can carry nine soldiers across at a time, and the crew of three engineers then paddles back to pick up another squad. 24-year-old Private First Class Andy McGlynn of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is in one of the five boats crossing the Moselle. We got our boats and started crossing under some small arms fire. The fella two ahead of me in my boat was killed. Never made a sound. It was when we got to the other side of the river and unloaded, he never moved. He just stayed there. German artillery takes out two of the boats. 
but somehow the rest of the battalion makes it across. Surprisingly, when the soldiers move inland, there is little resistance. They are now closer to Germany than anyone else on the Western Front. Their objectives are two hilltop forts. But when they see the rows of barbed wire and the thickness of these subterranean strongholds, it becomes clear they will need help. And then we really got hit. And then we were told, pull back to the river. One fellow was hit right behind me, right through the helmet, never made a sound. Just be died and instantly. McGlynn and the other survivors retreat to a wooded area next to the river. They set up a horseshoe-shaped defensive perimeter within the trees. It will become known as Horseshoe Wood. Back across the Moselle, half a mile to the west, Colonel Lemon wants to get across the river to join his men. But German artillery suddenly changes that plan when a shell strikes his jeep. The executive officer, the intelligence officer, a couple of key enlisted men, and my radio operator was killed. So I went to a uh, house in Dornot that had been fitted with uh, wire communications to the rear and uh, re-established the command post there. Lemon requests the heavily outnumbered soldiers be allowed to withdraw back across the river that night. But his commanders have other plans. They're trying to open another crossing a few miles to the south and need to keep the enemy near Dorno distracted. The request to withdraw is denied. One of the most difficult things I ever did in my life was to inform the troops that uh, they'd become expendable, that I had just received orders that they were to hold at all cost. That really gets your attention. The only thing Lemon can do now is pray that his entire battalion won't be wiped out trying to hold horseshoe wood. In August 1944, General Patton's troops often chewed up 50 miles a day as they pursued the retreating Germans across France. But now, in early September, Patton's historic advance has ground to a halt. It had to have been an incredibly frustrating situation for General Patton in late August, early September of 1944, when fuel resources were taken away from Third Army and then given to Field Marshal Montgomery, one of Patton's chief rivals, a, a person against which Patton often clashed, going back all the way to Sicily. Now the Germans facing Patton's men have regrouped along the Moselle River, but old blood and guts is slow to adjust to the new situation. In a letter to his wife, Beatrice, he writes, I am doing my damnedest to get going again, but it is hard. Once people stop, they get cautious and the enemy gets set. Books will someday be written on that pause which did not refresh anyone but the Germans. Patton's strategy in crossing the Moselle River is basically to regain the momentum he lost during the pause in September and cross the river basically on the run. Uh, this does not work because of the terrain his armor and infantry are not able to support each other. There are several crossings that the Germans cut off. They're quite bloody. September 8, 1944. The 2nd Battalion of the 5th Infantry Division's 11th Regiment is in the middle of one of those bloody crossings. The soldiers are trying to hold on to their small bridgehead across the Moselle at Dorno. There's no chance of escape until another crossing is made further south. That was the worst we had ever been in, from Normandy all the way through. We had never been in a point where we were trapped and had to suffer 
tanks and artillery and everything else. American artillery across the river joins in lobbing shells to try and hold the Germans back. Finally, on the night of September 10th, the crossing to the south is established. The desperate remaining soldiers at Dorno are allowed to retreat back across the river for a much needed break. They're passing out bottles of cognac. So I got a bottle and I found my buddy Sam and helped finish that cognac. The casualties in that thing across the river for the battalion was 80%. You don't have to be charging forward to be a hero. Holding the bridgehead against all odds, fighting, clawing, taking it to the enemy while you're sitting in a defensive position, those are real heroes in my book. By September 10th, Patton's Third Army finally receives enough gasoline to make a larger advance. He can see that Walton Walker and his corps are gonna have a tough time moving forward the fortified city of Metz has repelled attacks for centuries. 35 miles south of Metz, near the city of Nancy, looks like a softer target. But two of Patton's generals disagree about how Nancy should be taken. In command of the battle-hardened 4th Armored Division is General John Wood, an aggressive, larger-than-life character known to his men as Tiger Jack. His boss is General Matt Nettie, a friend of Eisenhower's who served with Patton in North Africa and Sicily. But Eddie has only been overseeing Wood in the Third Army since mid-August. Wood sees an opportunity north of Nancy where there's only one river, and he can advance rapidly and cut off Nancy. Eddie, the infantryman, wants to go south where he thinks resistance is a bit thinner, but there's a number of bridges. And infantrymen can cross rivers a lot easier than an armored division, obviously. This is not the first time Wood and Eddie have clashed, and it won't be the last. But Eddie finally agrees to a compromise and allows Wood to send half his armored forces around Nancy to the north, while the rest of the division will attack from the south. But at the same time, Hitler is preparing his own offensive. Against the advice of General Rundstedt, Hitler orders a major counterattack against old blood and guts. Hitler calls in one of the most gifted officers of the Third Reich from the Eastern Front to lead the assault. General Hassel von Manteuffel. At five foot two inches, his lack of height has never held him back. Hasse von Manteuffel was one of Germany's most decorated officers. He was one of only 27 recipients of the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds, highest decoration Germany could possibly give. He was also one of Germany's greatest battlefield commanders. Hitler wants Manteuffel to flank Patton's entire army. Hitler envisions a massive counterattack being thrust through Lorraine into the heart of the United States Third Army that would drive out of Lorraine, drive on to the ancient French city of Reims. But before the assault can kick off, Patton makes the opening move at Nancy. For now, Hitler's strategy has been put on hold. September 11th. The battle for Nancy gets off to a rough start to the south at the village of Bayonne as the riflemen of the 35th Infantry Division attempt to establish a bridgehead across the Moselle for the tanks of the 4th Armored, they encounter heavy firepower from the enemy's shore. Alvin Erzik, a native of Salem, Massachusetts, and an officer in the 8th Tank Battalion, knows that 3rd Army must make some progress soon. If they don't, Montgomery and the British will get their fuel again. And for the infantry to cross the river, for the engineers to come up and install a bridge would take two or three days. And we tankers said, there must be something we can do. So I led the forces along a canal to the north. When his unit takes a position overlooking the Moselle, Erzik spots what he thinks might be their ticket across. Below them, the Moselle has splintered, broken up by fingers of land. 
the first of the Iron Beasts enters the swift current of the Moselle. And it get going down deeper and deeper. Finally, it got to the point where the river is swirling around the tank. So uh, when he got there, he gunned the tank till he finally got across the Moselle River. One by one, the tanks of the 8th Battalion make it across, gunning their engines at just the right moment to push over the banks and climb out of the river. Now, mind you, this is a major river. This was totally, totally unconventional. Erzik and the determined tankers of the 8th Battalion have broken the stalemate south of Nancy. Patton finally has armor across the Moselle. But the fight for Nancy and the Moselle River is just getting started. Eastern France, September 13, 1944. General George S. Patton's forces are fighting the German army for control of the Moselle River. Patton is still trying to grab back the momentum he lost when his gasoline supplies were taken away at the start of the month. In those five days, really, at the beginning of September, that the Germans gain, because Patton is just flat out of fuel, really gives the Germans an opportunity to, to develop defenses along the Moselle River. In the north, Walker's 20th Corps has been pushed back at Dorno. But in the south, the tankers and riflemen of Matinetti's 12th Corps are slowly taking ground south of Nancy. 12 miles north of Nancy, American engineers are hard at work at the town of Du Loir. The 80th Division reaches the river, and through the, through the construction of a pontoon bridge, they're able to cross the Moselle on September 13th. This is the break 4th Armored Division Commander Tiger Jack Wood has been waiting for. One of the first units to cross is the 4th Armored's 37th Tank Battalion, under the command of 30-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams. Creighton Abrams is a real hero in our army because of his prowess on the battlefield, his charismatic leadership, his ability to train and prepare his unit for combat and then lead that unit in combat. As commander of the 37th Tank Battalion, he led from the front with a great deal of physical courage. He sensed opportunities and exploited them without hesitation. General Creighton Abrams was not only a hero in World War II, but he was somebody who inspired an entire generation of tankers. It was fitting that we named the M1 Abrams tank after him. Now, Abrams has his sights set on the goal of getting behind Nancy and cutting off the German-occupied city. General Wood's demand to attack Nancy from the north is paid off. In one day, Abrams' 37th Tank Battalion covers 15 miles. September 14th, 1944. The 4th Armored's Combat Command A has closed in on the vital town of Aracor on the main north-south road to the east of Nancy. From the south, Combat Command B, including Albin Erzik's 8th Tank Battalion, has fought its way northeast over three days, from Bayonne towards Mayex. The German forces in Nancy have been almost completely encircled. General Johann Blaskowitz has already ordered most of his troops to retreat toward the German border. Wood wants to race after them, but his boss, General Mattinetti, hesitates. Mattinetti regularly had conflict with General John Wood, commanding 4th Armored Division, with the approach to and the capture of the city of Nancy. Wood was frequently wanting bolder action. Eddie was a bit more cautious. So here, Nancy is taken, and he wants to pause for a number of days so he can tidy up his line. So Patton, wanting to show confidence in his commanders and Eddie's reluctance to move forward, combine to give another pause to the Germans and allow them to stiffen their resistance. And Adolf Hitler is quick to make the most of Patton's mistake. After days of delay, the Fuhrer's armored counterattack is about to begin. He wanted to strike deep into Allied territory before Patton took Nancy. But the German goal now is just to push Patton's forces back across the Moselle River. And Monteufel knows even this won't be easy. 
He knows that he has a limited amount of firepower, and he knows that the skies belong to the Allies. Yet, he's a German officer. He's going to follow orders. September 18th, 1944. Monteufel's assault begins. His target, Patton's forces along the Moselle and the town of Luneville, which the Nazis hope to use as a base of operations for ongoing attacks against Patton's soldiers. What they had were brand new Panther tanks, freshly minted out of the factories. These were Panther tanks mainly. These Panther tanks came out of the fog. There was a total surprise. But Monteufel's panzers encounter heavy resistance at Lunville by U.S. tank destroyers and artillery. Now the German commander is forced to change his plans. Monteufel redirects his units to take on Patton's tankers at the town of Aracor. Dawn, September 19th, 1944. The men of the 4th Armored's Combat Command A wake up to a French countryside covered in a thick layer of fog and a breakfast of German lead. During the battle that develops, C Company 37th Tank Battalion knocks out 11 German Panthers. Using the fog to mask their approach and to mask their position, they move quickly. They get around to the sides of the German Panthers, and they get in shots that disable and knock out the Panthers. Then, at 8 a.m., Captain Bill Dwight leads a platoon of M-18 tank destroyers on a seek-and-destroy mission. Joseph Bartow of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is a mechanic in the 704th Battalion, whose motto is seek, strike, destroy. You'd go out and try to find the enemy, and then strike the enemy, because once you found them, you had to kill them, and then get the hell out of the way. The M18 gun motor carriage, AKA Hellcat, has an open turret and is operated by a five-man crew. It's designed for rapid response and heavy firepower. The high-velocity 76-millimeter main gun packs a greater punch than the Sherman's main gun and its nine-cylinder engine makes the Hellcat the fastest piece of American armor with a top speed of 50 miles per hour. When they were in any kind of a fight, they brought us up in there because our guns could knock them out. Dwight's Hellcat platoon creeps through the fog and takes a position behind a low rise. 150 yards away, German tanks enter the crosshairs. In a matter of minutes, the M-18s knock out seven German tanks. Three of the Hellcats are destroyed, but Patton's gunners have forced the enemy column to fall back. But what they basically do is fire down on these German tanks and then back off the ridge so the Germans can't fire back, roll back up onto the ridge, fire another volley, and they keep this sort of back-forth attack going while they're holding the high ground. That afternoon, two miles east of Aracor, 37th Tank Battalion Commander Creighton Abrams forms a task force to search for enemy tanks. A Company joins James Leach's B Company. Leach is a South Carolina native who's already a veteran of the drive across France. It doesn't take Leach and his comrades long to find a good target in a valley. They found this entire German tank company. They were all dismounted, and they had a field kitchen there, and they were eating supper. And we were on top of them first thing you know it. We went completely through the German position and occupied their position. Nine tanks were the result of the combined fires of A Company and my company. The German assault on Aracor is a complete disaster. Thinking that his tankers have exhausted the enemy, 
Patton finally allows Wood to resume his drive to the German border. But Von Teufel isn't finished yet. The Battle of Arakor is far from over. Patton's tankers in the 4th Armored Division have been in the fight of their lives near the French town of Aracor. In the all-day slugfest, the combined firepower of Combat Command A has held back a major counterattack. And they've annihilated 50 enemy vehicles. This wasn't all done without mishap. Many of our tanks got uh, knocked out, got sick over it. Many of the boys that I knew, and uh, uh, we just just had to forget about it, and that's all. This is war, and this is what we had to go through. Now, on September 20th, Patton and the 4th Armored's commander, Tiger Jack Wood, think that yesterday's German attack is spent, and they can finally escape the stalemate of the Lorraine region. During one of the wettest Septembers on record, it's an area that Patton has come to hate as he makes crystal clear in a cable to the War Department. He writes that, in the final settlement of the war, you insist that the Germans retain Lorraine because I can imagine no greater burden than to be the owner of this nasty country. Patton and Wood have ordered Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams to get back on the road and drive to the east toward the German border at Sargamin. But German General Johann Blaskowitz knows that his supreme commander, Adolf Hitler, won't settle for a defeat. He's ordered General Hasso von Monteufel to continue the assault, no matter what the cost. Monteufel's in an impossible situation. This is why Hitler is regarded, and rightfully so, as, a, as not only a brutal and and murderous uh, dictator, but also an extremely ineffective commander-in-chief. He becomes very directive and says, continue to counterattack at this particular place. And it's a place where there was a very well-organized defense. Now, two full panzer brigades move in through the woods outside of Arakor and try to catch Combat Command A from behind. Monteufel's forces outnumber Abrams two to one. When the Germans came out of the woodwork, they started shooting in our direction. I engaged them, held them at bay. Leach sounds the alarm. Abrams immediately orders his 37th Tank Battalion to turn back and engage the enemy forces. Just south of Arakor, The 155 millimeter guns of the 191st Field Artillery use withering fire to hold back the Panzers. While Leach and his platoon leaders attempt to size up the situation, a German tank moves into position and opens fire. And it appeared to me he was shooting at my command tank. So I ran toward my tank, motioning him to back up Back on him, back up, back up. And he did. But suddenly he stopped, as if he was thinking, maybe the captain wants to get up on the tank. And the moment he stopped, the third round, two of them had missed him, the third round hit right in the right front of the tank. Cut the bow gunner in half and knocked the head off my driver. Two very heroic young men and had no idea what hit them. While B Company attempts to rally, C Company is also hit hard and loses five Shermans in a matter of seconds. Facing a much larger German tank force, both American companies pull back behind the cover of a large ridge. The Shermans are moving 
they're maneuvering, they're placing fire on the enemy. By the time that the engagement finally breaks away and both sides pull away from one another, um, an equal number of tanks are knocked out on the battlefield, 11 Germans to 11 Shermans. By the end of the day, Monteufel's assault has stalled out. Blaskowitz's army has failed to shove Patton's armor back across the Moselle. Hitler is enraged. On the 21st, the Nazi dictator retaliates by firing Blaskowitz. The fighting outside of Aracor rages on for days as the men of the 4th Armored hold off repeated panzer assaults. And for Monteufel's panzer forces, it just keeps getting worse. In the skies above, P-47 Thunderbolts use occasional breaks in the dreary weather to slam the enemy armor. So now you've got the P-47s diving in. The Shermans are kicking butt. The Germans are in big trouble now. That's a real one-two punch. But still, the Nazi high command insists on repeated armor assaults on Patton's forces throughout the region. Hitler is hell-bent on driving Patton out of Lorraine. Dawn, September 24th, 1944. Alban Erzik and the men of the 8th Tank Battalion are on a ridge 19 miles northeast of Nancy. Suddenly, the forest in front of them roars to life. Out of the mist and the fog, we looked up, and this force, large, massive force, is moving out of the woods toward us. Their infantry on the ground, they had mostly Panther tanks with two or three Tigers amongst them, and they're advancing. Erzik's tankers know they're no match for the German armor in a face-to-face -face shootout. One of the Americans facing the attack is Frank Dudash of Crown Point, Indiana. We never would attack one-on-one. -on -one. We'd attack two-on-one. -on -one. We'd get behind them and put around in their engine compartment because that's where the, the thinnest part of armor is on any armored vehicle. Erzik's men use the same tactics as their comrades up at Aracor. We were looking down at them. They're on the flat ground coming toward us. So we'd get two or three or four shots off before the panther or the tiger could get a shot at us. So the tanks would come up on the ridge and fly bang, bang, bang. So we were knocking out quite a few of them. The panzers are quick to respond. The enemy tanks unleash a deadly barrage of 75 and 88 millimeter fire. The worst, most horrendous noise that I've ever heard in my life was when an 88 hits a ridge and goes ricocheting off. You talk about locomotives and roars of uh, planes. If Patton's tankers are going to survive this slugfest with the enemy, they're going to need help. September 24, 1944. For nearly a week, German General Hasso van Monteufel's Panzer Brigades have been doing all they can to dislodge General George S. Patton's Third Army from its foothold east of the Moselle River. Patton's army has been countering each move that Monteufel makes, but the Germans aren't showing any signs of letting up. Near the town of Chateau Saline, Alban Erzik's battalion is facing a heavy assault by German armor. If Erzik and his men can't hold the line, the Germans could make a mad dash all the way to Nancy. We were at a great disadvantage because the Tiger and the Panther had better guns head on than we did. Heavy cloud cover has kept American aircraft from joining the action. The 
fog is heavy, it's rainy. They were flying over, but this uh, cloud cover was so thick that they couldn't come down. Just when it looks like Ursic's unit will be overrun, the cloud cover begins to break. There was a little hole of blue opened up in the sky, and the hole kept getting bigger and bigger, and then all of a sudden it was big enough for our fighter support to come down. If they come so low, it would be scary because they would drop the bomb in the air behind you. It's like it was coming right at you, you know? And then, of course, it would sail over your head, go right into the target. Twenty-three panzers have been destroyed. Three hundred soldiers have been killed. And 194 have been captured. The Nazis' attempt to break through to Nancy has failed. Hitler wants to keep pressing the attack, but his commanders are sitting there thinking, with what? The whole counterattack is shot. Following their historic offensive advance in August, Patton and his men have proven in September that they can be just as deadly in a defensive struggle. They've destroyed or damaged almost 500 German tanks and assault guns, plus another 150 armored vehicles in just one month of fighting in Lorraine. The Battle of Arakor has become one of the largest tank battles of the war, and the place where the myth of German armored superiority has died. Fantastic example of the American military, particularly U.S. Army Armored Forces, who have learned how to take what they have, the Sherman tank, which was certainly not the best tank of World War II, and make it deadly on the battlefield when you are facing the enemy that does have some of the best armored vehicles of the entire war. Despite the victories on the battlefield, Patton's in for a major disappointment. Just as in early September, Patton doesn't have enough fuel to follow up his success on the battlefield. Eisenhower again diverts Patton's fuel to British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. He gave Montgomery the fuel that he requested, and Montgomery launched this operation, which of course we know as Operation Market Garden. Operation Market Garden ultimately did not succeed. Any opportunity to end the war before Christmas has just been lost. Instead, Patton is ordered to stop any plans for an advance east of Nancy and to dig in along the Moselle near Metz. They're dealing with a deteriorating weather situation that's only going to get worse as the days tick by, and they're dealing with shortages of supplies. September is the critical month of the supply shortages of the Allied armies that are fighting in Europe. But even though the rapid advance is over, the fighting rages on. Forced to settle in for a long and deadly siege near the battlefields where he fought in World War I, Patton will face a new challenge and yet another tough opponent in the month ahead. Nazi General Hermann Balk, Blaskowitz's replacement, is digging in for a last-ditch battle to keep Patton out of Germany. Soon on Patton 360, General Walton Walker's 20th Corps and the men of the 5th Infantry Division are about to take on Balk's defenses at Metz. And the heavy guns of a mysterious enemy stronghold known as Fort Driant. For Patton, it seems that Lorraine will continue to be a sea of mud and blood.